Listener Production. Hi, Simon Beeson with you for this episode of The Briefing. Between 2018 to February of this year, Danish pharmaceutical company Novo Nordisk went from a market value worth $17 billion to over $554 billion, making them Europe's most valuable company. So what happened? Well, one of their products went ballistic. A Zempic happened. Technically a medication to treat diabetes, and in fact, in Australia, it's only approved to be used for that, The active ingredient in Ozempic, semaglutide, has seen monumental demand worldwide as a weight loss wonder drug. And after news of worldwide shortages, the proliferation of copycat drugs, a lot of commentary over whether the gains or losses of using semaglutide outweigh the side effects, now there's a new question being asked. Could Ozempic be used to curb other desires aside from food? There's been anecdotal reports that it's helped reduce drinking, smoking, even other drug use like opioids. And now research is being undertaken to try and find out if science backs up these claims. Dr. Lee Walker from the Florey Institute investigates the neurobiology of disorders and has been looking into the research in this space. Lee, thanks for joining us on The Briefing. Thank you so much for having me. How would semaglutide, the active ingredient in Zempic, work to stop addiction uh, to alcohol and opioids? Well, we're not quite sure yet, but what we do know is that in, you know, populations of people who do take drugs or use alcohol, that that there seems to be some people who will also reduce their intake. And, you know, there's people who are sort of saying alongside food cravings that their cravings for drugs and for alcohol are reduced. But how it's acting in the brain, we're still not 100% sure, but this is, you know, the research that's sort of still going on now. Well, so far trials have been done, but only on animals. What have we found from those? So there are trials in animals and in humans. So um, yeah, so we've recently just been looking to put together a study and done a a scan of the literature. So there's over 30 different animal studies that have looked at these drugs like Ozempic that target the GLP-1 receptor. And across different drug classes, they've all primarily shown to to be able to reduce drug and alcohol intake. There's also been several trials in humans, and there's another nine trials currently ongoing. Wow. Um, And the results in humans are a little less straightforward. So the largest trial has been done in alcohol use, and this was, I think, 157 people. And what it showed was that in people who have comorbid obesity, that it would reduce their alcohol intake, but only in the people that also um, had obesity. And what's really interesting about this is that actually in people who were of normal weight, that it actually had a, a, the opposite effect and actually increased their alcohol use. Wow. Yeah. So this is where we have to be a little bit careful about, you know, understanding what's happening and understanding who this drug might be able to help. Yeah, well, I read that although these results are promising, it's still too early to tell if it will be safe and effective in humans with alcohol use disorder, nicotine addiction or uh, other drug dependence. How does that work if we're talking about safety when this medication is already being used so widely and I'm sure that there are already situations where people on this medication have addictions? Yes, absolutely. It's not necessarily a problem that it's already out there um, because that's where we're getting a lot of anecdotal evidence from. But in terms of safety, there's a lot that's different in the brain of somebody who has been using a lot of alcohol or drugs and the fact that, you know, these chemicals change our, our brain as well. So this can sort of mean that drugs have different effects. So We just need to be careful and make sure that, you know, these safety trials are done to make sure that we are checking what's happening in people before, you know, we move into um, repurposing, I guess, and it becoming more mainstream. How long does it usually take to go from these sorts of trials to a medication being readily available for human consumption in a new setting or environment? I mean, it completely depends. As I said, there's nine different trials currently underway. So, you know, a trial will take anywhere from, you know, one to three years. And then we need to look at long-term safety as well. So, you know, looking at 12 months after taking medication and what's happening in the long term. So 
I mean, it could be anywhere from one to five years until we really understand what's happening. But the other problem that's, you know, obviously arisen in this whole thing is that the availability of these drugs is, you know, really short at the moment. And who needs these drugs the most and or, you know, where priorities are going is is also a, a big topic. Can you tell me a bit about the potential side effects of using a drug like Asempic to treat addiction would be? How, how would this differ? Yeah, well, so in a lot of people who have um, addiction, they also actually have lower BMI or a lower body weight. So taking a drug that is going to reduce your body weight even further could be detrimental to, to some people. But then again, in people who, you know, have comorbid obesity and alcohol use or drug use, then there's not going to be that same side effect. There's also been other side effects that have been shown. There's a, 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 a clinical trial or a, um, a study ongoing in Europe at the moment about potential suicidal thoughts alongside using Ozempic. There's a wide range of things that still really need to be fleshed out. And as we were talking about earlier, it's really come in hot and fast. And, you know, a lot of people have jumped on the bandwagon and, and wanting to use it. But, you know, really understanding how it's um, working in different populations is important. Well, there's also been a few studies that show that people put weight back on once they stop using Asempic. Would it be likely or possible that people using Asempic to treat addiction would also lean back into the addiction uh, when they stop using it? Yeah, absolutely. We, we have no idea. But that is completely possible. So if you're taking a drug and it's reducing your craving at the time, so what often happens with people with addiction is that, you know, while they're abstinent or not taking drugs, they, you know, and they're taking a drug that will help them to to maintain their abstinence, then that's not a problem. But if they go off that drug and then something stressful happens in their life or there's a relationship breakdown, you know, a number of different things, then this can trigger a number of feelings that make them want to take drugs again. So if you don't have availability of drugs or if you're not taking a drug anymore, then our brains have changed and are more predisposed to want to to use that drug to to have that, you know, safety net or that feeling again. Yeah. And I know that there's been many studies already done on animals and as you mentioned, there's some on humans now. We're talking about it. It's part of the conversation, but where are we in the process? How how long? I mean, so at the moment, technically, it, you could be prescribed these compounds for addiction if you had a comorbidity of obesity. But at the moment, where the TGA stands is that we're prioritising treatment of people who are stably taking Ozempic for type 2 diabetes. Once supply of the drug is more readily within the population, then we'll probably see that it goes into people as well who want to treat obesity. And then that's where, you know, if you have a comorbidity, that's where we're going to be seeing a lot more people with addiction who are taking these drugs and have a lot more information about it as well. And you touched on this a little bit ago, but we already know that demand for Ozempic is so massive and it's outpaced the current supply. How would bring in another uh, area that we, we're using this medication to treat, like addiction, would that just lead to more supply issues? I mean, potentially, yes, but I'll actually here highlight a, a study that was actually done at the Flory Institute, which is where I'm a researcher, uh, by Professor Akta Hassan. And so their lab, they're a chemistry lab, and they've actually recently found a new way to make this drug in a much more uh, fast and cheap way. So they're sort of working on ways that we can get the supply chain, you know, to meet demand. And so this drug is very hydrophobic, so it's it's very hard to to make. But they've found a new way to to synthesize this drug. So we're really excited about that as well, um, because you know if we can make more of this drug and get it out to people who need it, and we can have more research then into understanding who it's going to be useful for and and the subpopulations of people that that might get help from this. That's so interesting. Thank you, Dr. Lee Walker. Thank you. And that is all that we have time for today. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll be back in your feed tomorrow from 6am with another rep. And if you did find this chat interesting, please do share it around with a friend or family member and make sure you hit follow so you never miss anything from us. 
My name is Simon Beaton. See you soon.